All right, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this webinar on strategies for creating a work culture people don't want to quit. Um, we are just gonna give people a few minutes to join us. Um, so while we wait, if you would like to put in the chat tab um, where in the world you are joining us from, and if you are joining or if you're working um, in person, hybrid or remote. Oh, Boston, that's where I'm from. Great. Working remotely. Yep. Remote. Toronto, France. Oh, lots of people writing so fast. Another Boston. Yep. Columbus, Ohio. Okay. And a hybrid on the office. All right. A lot of answers coming in. So hard to have an overview, but it looks like still a lot of remote working for people and a lot of um, people from all over the world joining us, which is great. Yep. Wow. Okay, great. Um, great. Okay. Well, I'm so glad to, to have everyone um, for this event today. I think we can um, kick it off now. So again, um, thank you everyone for joining us um, for this webinar on how to create a work culture that people do not want to quit. Um, I'm Robin and I'm part of the content team here at 360 Learning. Um, we have some amazing speakers that I'm going to introduce in just a moment. Um, but before I do, um, a couple of housekeeping um, notes. Um, you will all receive the recording of this uh, presentation at the end, um, and the slides will be made available to you. Uh, we will have a live Q&A at the end, and if questions come to you um, during the presentation, please put those in the questions tab at the bottom right of your screen, um, not the chat tab. That will just help us to keep track of them. Um, also, we'll be launching a couple of polls um, throughout the presentation, so again, you can answer those um, in the dedicated polls section. Um, and also, at the very bottom of your screen, you should see a little smiley face. Um, if you click that, that will send up little emoji um, reactions um, that you can, yep, yeah, just like that, exactly, yep, 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 <laughs> that you can use to um, show us how you're um, reacting to the presentation. So we, we certainly um, encourage you to use those. All right, so uh, today we are going to be hearing from Audrey Jarre, who is head of learning at 360 Learning and Alison Lee, um, who is a coach at Bravely. Today, we are going to be talking about lessons learned from the great resignation, um, still a very hot topic for everyone, I'm sure. We're gonna go over how to prevent burnout um, and build resilience within your teams, um, how to use coaching to motivate and retain employees. We're going to look at the importance um, of employee growth, leveling the playing field for everyone and preventing bore out, especially for the baby boomer um, generation. And we're gonna finish up with how to bring your DEI programs to life. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand uh, the mic off to Allison. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are from the world. So let's get started. Um, lessons learned from the great resignation why people leave as the great resignation has been underway it's not an exaggeration to say that the companies worldwide are struggling to react and adapt so is this turnover preventable and if so how can we hr practitioners anticipate turnover and return our best of the best employees so according to a recent study analyzed the survey responses over 300,000 employees who voluntarily left over 15 months before and during COVID, there are three main reasons why employees leave. Number one, career growth. Employees who left answered less favorably to the question, so comparing to who stayed. Um, the question is, I believe there good career opportunities for me. In fact, one in three employees chose lack of growth as their top reason for leaving the time of exit. Number two, road expectations, right? So unsurprisingly, employees who ended up leaving also responded less favorably to the statement, I am happy with my role relative to what was described to me. And about this one, coaching conversations over and over again, I heard people sharing that. I thought I was hired to work on Project A, and guess what? I'm doing B. 
I feel stuck and I cannot find a way out. So I think the best way for me to do is to find a different place. Um, number three, inclusion, right? So those who ended up leaving also answer less favorably to the question that measured belonging, inclusion and the belonging. So after two years into pandemic, burnout has now also become a major challenge to employee performance and the job satisfaction. At Bravely, our coaching experience is that there has been 700% increase of conversations around stress and the burnout. And personally, my number is even higher. I mainly work with engineers and leaders from the technology industry, which is my background prior to coaching. Coaching conversations that do not have the word stress or burnout are probably, so this is my own data, probably still single digit among the thousand sessions I've had the past three years. Working from home, isolation, having to manage, working while taking care of young child or sick families, right? All of this add up. The impact from burnout is simply enormous. One trillion dollars a year is lost in productivity due to burnout. 120,000 people will die from health issues related to burnout annually in US alone. And the 41% of the global workforce is looking to leave in the next three months because of a burnout. Right? So sharing those stats here as the numbers are simply dro dropping, but they help us understand what we are tackling here, right? crystal clear impact our solutions can make to help our employees and businesses. So in this Harvard Business Review study of 1,500 business people in 46 countries, the researchers found 89% of employees believe their work-life balance is getting worse, and 85% said their well-being has declined. Another 57% believe the pandemic has completely dominated their work. So that's more than half of participants, half of 1,500 business people in 46 countries. So here's a poll for all of us, right? Now we've talked about why people leave and the stress, burnout being a challenge to productivity and the job satisfaction. I wonder, I'm curious, what's your thought to the question here? Percentage of employees likely to job how next year? So we have 30, 45, 60, and 70%. So in the poll, share, share with me, share with everyone here, what number you believe to be true. And I think um, the poll will be available for a little while. Let me do this. Let's take another maybe 10 seconds. Um, and before we move on, I will share the answer. So maybe for this poll, answer um, as, as, as soon as you can. So before I spill the things, before I share with everyone, let me take a look. Okay. All right. I hope you got a chance to share the number. Um, according to 2021 Achievers Engagement and the Retention Report, 70%. So the answer is 70%. 70% of employees are likely to job hunt in the next year for the reasons just discussed, especially burnout. Okay. So let's take a closer look into burnout. Research identified five main factors for burnout. Workload, lack of recognition, unclear communication, lack of support, and a false sense of urgency. 
就 in one on one coaching, many people have shared anxiety around the workload due to lack of proper support, clear communication, and false sense of urgency. Pretty much, you check the whole list here. For example, right?、Um, what does taking a couple of days off mean to us nowadays? Time off, great. Longer days before and after. Not so much, right? So the words "daunting," "exhausting," "terrified" are the very ones I hear in coaching sessions. That's what people share with me. Many managers and ICs share the sentiment that taking PTO can set themselves up for failure because of the unsustainable level of work required after coming back to the office. So the question for us, HR leaders, executive coaches, how can we help people proactively approach work, life, right, own their mental health and the well-being, versus being chased by deadlines or inflexible work cultures? So that way, as people, if we can enable people to proactively figure out, then we. Tackle these issues, right? Those five factors to burnout from a high level. Then we can also put strategies and processes in place to support our people. Oh, compassion!、Uh, compassion, I think. Compassion is the recipe to address burnout and build resilience. Right. So for companies, compassion. This word. Can be scary to use to talk about right the touchy feeling.、Um, however, it is necessary to build a healthy culture and use compression,、uh, com- compassion as a measure to drive towards right. So that translates into does an org understand what people need and offers resources in a fair and equitable fashion. Is there any critical area that historically has not been budgeted and funded? And if so, let's aggressively explore and invest. So, for example, um, briefly, um, when we offer coaching, coaching sessions are available to all employees, and that's how we practice um equity. Um, and also really educate managers to learn about the coaching, and also introduce to their teams and the direct reports about how coaching can help、uh, with the development or let's just say life and the work stress and the burnout in general. Okay, leading with empathy. Empathy really goes hand in hand with compassion. It starts at the top. That leaders model authenticity, vulnerability, and transparency. So, what we observe at Bravely is that when managers try coaching, they immediately encourage their whole team to tap into coaching for support, which is just wonderful, right? You can tell the managers educate themselves, knows what resources are available, and. Tries out themselves and probably also be a little bit vulnerable, sharing their with their own team. They also struggled, yeah. Therefore, recommend this resource. So behind that, I think is empathy, right? That leader leadership style.、Um, to share with my own experience, outside one on one coaching, I also ran the workshops on. Various mental health topics like mindfulness, stress, and the burnout. A lot of times after the workshop, managers approach me and ask, "Hey, this is so amazing! I just learned. I can see how to apply in my own life." But Alison, how can I teach my directs? How can I teach my team? Maybe I only have a ten or twenty minutes. So how do I do that? Um, usually, I I tell managers, "Hey, it's so wonderful、um, that you are interested in learning how to teach people." But let me ask you this question: Do you, uh, personally, do you do you want to do you care to learn about this content and to be able to to train other people? If yes, let me teach you. But if not, think about. Think about if there might be other ways for you to just do the same to support your team, right? Is it likely your company already has some resources available just like this? 
Would you like to point your team, your people to that resource so you don't have to personally do them? And usually managers are like, oh yeah, totally, I can do that. And then we talked about, hey, being authentic of yourself, we just share a little bit. So the fact that you open up, you struggled here and there a little bit, and this is how you learn, this is how you improve. That can be so encouraging, you know, in the future, if someone on your team struggle the same way. They probably will be thinking about you and there you go, right? You introduce a resource. So leading with like empathy, uh, being yourself and the transparency really comes from the top. All right. Clarity is kindness. This is by Brittany Brown. Remote environment really increases the delta between what needs to be communicated and what effectively receive right the start in between so in coaching a lot of times people bring situations say friction conflicts right um, or important conversations let's say promotion for example and what we do in coaching is we replay slow down sentence by sentence sometimes to figure out what the start is after that, it usually flows, right? We know, okay, what needs to be done? This is how I'd like to do it. This is how I'd like my team to receive that communication. So create a culture of being intentional with what and how we communicate helps bridging this delta. Trust. Um, trust is simply the foundation of any human relationship, I think, right? So between direct reports and the managers, customers, and service or product providers, among peers and colleagues. As business moves so fast and we continue to operate in hybrid and remote mode, effective leadership requires connection. So when we hire and train employees, ICs, and the managers, really look for this quality. Is this individual intentional with building relationships and winning trust from stakeholders? Prioritize development and the purpose, right? So as identified at the beginning of the webinar, uh, limited career growth is the number one reason people leave. This aligned with what I have observed in coaching as well. So seeing someone, right, seeing their own purpose and being able to map a path is critical for ambitious professionals. Guess what? These are the very people, very employees we want to keep. So as we work, we want to help employees to see visible path, right? And set them up for success, in providing opportunities and the resources and encourage employees to explore and find stage, right? What the stage is and how they can enter and shine. Such vision gives strength and the faith to work through stress and build resilience. So my only example I share with people who come to coaching looking for inspiration is that um, when I work for Amazon Operations, the North America supply chain team, which is a big division, um, the team held a Shark Tank competition and simply opened it up to all, to everyone. And then me as a newbie just completed onboarding, pitch and won a sponsorship. So it was such a life for me. So in coaching, I always ask people, if there isn't an exciting project in front of you, ready to be claimed, can you, or can you and I, can we think of something that you are so good at and we might be able to find a space that can hold it. Okay. So as a work, we want to make sure such spaces are available and reachable for our employees. So they go to get it, go in and develop themselves. So 
as we have talked about preventing burnout and building resilience as HR practitioners, putting strategies and the processes to help employees navigate through these two very challenging topics. Let me also point out that coaching can be a powerful tool resource to achieve both. So from my coaching experience, what people like about working with a coach, getting individual support is one, we build a personal and a professional relationship solely to support them. So I come from coach, come from a neutral position with their interest in mind and heart. We have very equal conversations, curiously and appreciatively explore options for them. So people feel that they can and are encouraged to be themselves, also knowing that I'm here to process Call the thoughts and the challenging emotions with them together. And two, the confidence, of course, in my industry knowledge, professional training, who I am as a person, uh, bravely allows employees to indicate their preferences in coaches they'd like to work with. So many people come to me for certain personal and professional background or identity I hold, and this is great. This really works for them. So I think, actually, I think this is very empowering, right? In a sense that employees are gathering or assembling resources in a way they prefer. And of course, doing coaching, employees have a lot of control in what to work on and how to approach topics of their choices. To so individualize the support, uh, specifically tackling areas of work and the life that creates stress and I think is the key to address burnout. Um, so I really we always say we partner with employees for moments that matter, right? make or break their experience as work life is a dynamic with ups and downs filled with a wide range of emotions. Right? So for example, onboarding. In the remote, hybrid, or in office, if someone doesn't feel supported the first 90 days, and doesn't have a clarity, it's very easily to experience anxiety and stress. Where conflicts is natural for all of us to feel intense and frustrated. Of course, when it comes to performance reviews, we can be nervous and maybe exciting just all at the same time. Promotion can be happy, but maybe a little bit terrified and anxious, right? all mixed together. So these are the very moments of us to focus as an organization. Are we properly supporting employees? There are also the moments inside of work, we as HR practitioners have some degree of control and can ahead of time allocated resources is for. Then we layer in situations outside our control, right? Maybe someone is caring for a sick family or become a new parent. Definitely it's gonna impact how people show up at work. And that's critical, right? What's the most critical is that people feel supported in any of these instances and they have the tools to propel them professionally. And let's also acknowledge macro elements like organizational change or the pandemic, right? They disrupt employees experiences and impact anyone's ability to show up and perform at a high level consistently. So for all of these critical moments within or outside our control, right? unfortunately won't be thoroughly understood by us all the time. And that is when individualized approaches coming, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I think I think I yeah, I think I have a couple of minutes. So let me share my own experience again of uh, being supported by by my colleagues in critical moments like this. Um, I was born and grew up in Wuhan, China. So when the pandemic first broke out, it really hit home was extremely mentally and emotionally difficult for me. I am simply grateful for my coach network um, support me so much. Right? So many individual 
conversations and connections gave me this firm glimpse of light and hope and the warmth. And I think it makes the biggest difference for me. I think that was the very reason stopped me from developing into burnout from emotionally stressed. And also later on, how so much, and this is also the reason, the support I received, right, sustained and empowered me working with individuals and the teams on this very topic, COVID-related life and work stress. Um, and the last year, anti-Asian racism, it's a very heavy one. And now, proactively prevent burnout at an organizational level. So I personally, I thank you for, for your support in the chat. I can see. Thank you. I appreciate. Um, but that's another reason. I'm a firm believer in meaningful relationships and individual support. Okay. All right. So come back. Come back to you while we are. Uh, uh, how we want to support employees in an intentional way, right? A research tells us that positive experience in those critical moments simply drives employee engagement and performance because it gives employees a sense of belonging, psychological safety, foster connection and purpose, both personally and professionally, as well as building resilience. And just never in my own coaching experience, it never fails to surprise me how far people reach and how fast they do that. Just doing several months of work together because of this very positive experience with the supply elements here. So I have talked about preventing burnout, building resilience, and using coaching as a tool to help develop and retain employees. Now let me hand the stage to Audrey, who's going to dive deep into employee growth and DEI. Thank you, Allison, and thank you for sharing your story and all this interesting thing that we can all put in place and our practices may be as coaches, managers, or even individual contributors when, when talking with our peers. Often we believe the kind of the L and D or the HR team is the only person, like the only person, the only group that can make a difference. But I think it's, as you said, it's all about creating that culture across the organization. And that what we've we've tried to do at 360. So I'll share a few insights from uh, my experience there and from the HR practices we, we put in place. Uh, I've been working at 360 for four years in four different jobs. So um, as far as employee growth in co is concerned, I think we've kind of found the magic recipe in giving transparency about this. So I can't wait to tell you tell, tell you more about this. So I'll focus today on three ingredients for that magic recipe uh, for creating a workspace people don't want to quit. Uh, the first one would be focusing on employee growth with career development, internal mobility. The second one was, will be making sure that everyone feels they have an equal shot as is career development and it's something that's transparent and they know how to access. And finally, retaining baby boomer talent, who we found in our research are at risk of bore out. And we're all about talent acquisition these days and having new hires, but it's also important to find uh, find ways in which to make people interested and motivated in staying within your organization. Uh, so the results I'll be sharing are based on the survey we conducted in late 2021 20, over a thousand US-based employees. So I think these data points uh, will, will speak by themselves, but I'll still comment on them. So first, um, maybe speaking about these career pathways, um, the first element I wanted to outline is that despite the name Great Resignation and everything we're saying about it, Americans still care a lot about their jobs and they remain a huge part of self-identity, which is why it's so important that things go well. As the pandemic made their job, if only feel more important to them. But as you can also see on the slide, employees aren't hesitating to leave jobs that they don't find fulfilling or stimulating. So the, the perspective has changed, but um, it doesn't mean that uh, they, they will stay around if you don't provide these opportunities. 
internal mobility wasn't a solution to old on to these employees and for those who were motivated to ask in our survey uh, almost half were turned away and there were no options for them and only half of employees who were looking for these greener pastors think they have the necessary skills to follow the desired career path so it's not only about succeeding but also about feeling empowered to make the move towards something different so I believe this is a missed opportunity for HR and L&D teams, and there may be something we do about that to build a clear career path from the get go so that the employees know exactly where they're going and when they're going there. Embracing this mindset of internal mobility is a great way not to lose employees that need a change of pace, that need a different career trajectory. And we, we've, we've put in place many opportunities for people to shadow others, but also to be mentored by others in order to see where they can go next and how they can project themselves differently inside the organization. Um, so it will be my, my turn to kind of share uh, my personal story here and, and to showcase how internal mobility can mean something different to, to all of us. Uh, so you may have seen online, we, we made a, a series about it where um, I share too much about why I'm making that change and what it means to me. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I invite you to watch it. <laughs> uh, I, I felt that making that move was especially important for me because I was able to go from a manager role to an individual contributor role, meaning that internal mobility can mean many things. It doesn't just mean that you have to go up the organization and manage a team if it's not what you want to do at this point of your career. In my, my perspective on this mobility was that I wanted to develop a new skill set and ultimately lead a team in that respect, which I'm doing now. But I really enjoyed having a year where I was an internal uh, individual contributor in the team and that I was able to build my skill set slowly. I think it's very valuable to show that um, it's not only about kind of bringing value to the organization and moving up on one single career path, but also about enabling transversal moves that will make your organization richer. Because when moving from one part to another, your employees bring a different kind of tool, toolkit, a different kind of knowledge. We've had many people from our client success team move to product and they bring an invaluable uh, amount of customer insights. So I really encourage you to look at this in terms of not only what is a clear career pathway, for example, to move in the sales organization from BDR to account executive, but also thinking of it from a perspective. How do you enable people to see what's around? How do you create that transparency for people to be aware of what they can do next and find way also to illustrate themselves and, and, and showcase the skill set, even if they're doing another job. Uh, we'll speak about d and I in a moment. It's true that uh, in my case, working as a side project in our d and I group on creating a coaching program for women was a great first step into l and d from my role in customer education. It enabled me to meet the right stakeholders, build my skill set, have a first go at program management, and ultimately was what favored my internal um, mobility later on. So I think having as many opportunities for people to go beyond their day job and experiment what it could be to change careers and develop is really important. Speaking of uh, leveling the playing field for, for women in the workplace, um, a few, again, a few data points to share with you today. So women and men face different challenges that were exacerbated during that great resignation time we discussed. Uh, for instance, uh, no surprises here, women feel less confident than men that they have the skills to leave their job and pursue the career they really want. And as far as the complaints are concerned, while both men and women complained of low salaries, uh, the people who seem more affected by burnout were women again. There are many, uh, there's a lot of documentation about the barriers for to women achieving equal status as men at work. And a lot of it has to do with a, a broken rung at the beginning of management, uh, where it was few people making it to the upper echelons. So we think that training, transparency and coaching can help fix that and even the playing field to ensure employers build workplaces favorable to, to women's development. We've done a few things in that respect in the past few years as part of our DNI group. We, we started with a very basic but very powerful anti-bias training to address implicit bias both in hiring and promotions. 
And it's true that most hiring managers and interviewers who went through the course actually realized they were guilty of at least one of the bias because it's something if you don't actively share it and actively train people on it, there will be there will be no impact because there won't be a realization of what's going on in your head when you're doing an interview. So if you want to embrace these internal mobilities and promote women, I think an anti-bias training is a good first step. We also make everything available. So when I say everything, I'll, I'll show you later in the slide, but compensation, performance reviews, promotion figures, everything is uh, in our internal communication system so that everyone can call out any bias or any favoritism. And finally, and uh, speaking to the point about coaching earlier, we've instituted coaching for women to help ensure gender parity in leadership position. One of our key focus in 2020 was to ensure we would get a good uh, gender ratio at the organization level. I think right now our biggest focus is to do the same thing uh, at the leadership scale. And so we're progressing every year. And whenever you're in hyper growth like us and you're recruiting a lot of people in tech and sales, it can be hard to get those figures. But we believe that promoting people internally is also one of the solutions, which is why we've uh, started that coaching program to help people think about what they can do, help them have that trigger that will lead them to, uh, to something different. So our developmental coaching program was launched uh, two years ago, and we measure a few things um, in terms of abilities that people will be trained on. So I think the most popular last time were confidence in decision making, tackling more tra strategic topics, and finally breaking down into small chunks, complex projects. And we had like a, an improvement uh, self-reported by women from 2.5 to 6.9 out of 10 on these. And again, it's only the first step and maybe the work needs to be something that's done uh, on, the, on a personal level or, or with your manager. But I think having that first step with a coach was really important in, in making people get away maybe from that imposter syndrome and take ownership over their career. I'm not only going to talk about women today, but also about the baby boomer generation as a whole. Um, if you think about Bora, if you think about stagnation, that may ring a bell for everyone. But we found that this was particularly important and painful for that generation. Um, many bo baby boomers were tempted to take early retirement during the Great Resignation, feeling that work was both undervalued and that they had no room to grow. So I think that's a problem. If people in your organization feel there's no room for career development, you should address it. And I believe it's where engagement surveys and making sure you tell the pulse of your organization is key to make sure that if those figures indeed apply in your organization, you're thinking of how to make sure that these people will be able both to learn, but also to teach. Because it's not only about providing some kind of training standardized for these people. It's also about making sure that this goes the other way around. We're uh, big fans at 360 of a collaborative learning approach. Uh, this is no secret to you if you've attended a few of our webinars. And we feel that it can help show older workers their skills are still valuable. And also keep this important institutional knowledge inside an organization, even after the employee leaves, ultimately. So asking, and this is what I mean when I say collaborative learning, asking baby boomers to share their knowledge with younger colleagues through course creation or life training might make them feel more valued while at the same time ensuring younger peers continue to learn. Uh, this learning approach is not only about themselves being training others, but also having a bottom up learning approach with learning needs for to get at the root of what these people need to learn. If they have a lot to teach, what remains uh, important for their personal development? So by all means, go directly to the source and ask baby boomer what they want to be learning and when so that they don't feel their career development is stopped. The collaborative learning movement is 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 about these two things, and and I'll be, before moving to D and I, I'll, I'll just close on on this uh, is going away from a top down approach, which will lead inevitably to these frustrations about people feeling that their specificities are not taken into account, and moving to a much more bottom up approach. In the end, what you will end up with is a bit similar to coaching, as in it's a very personalized approach to what you need to learn, what you need to be told, what you need to be asked, 
at a specific moment. And it's why we really believe it's a key approach for learning today to keep learning innovative and make sure that people will want to stay in your organization. So a few insights about bringing the DNI program to life. If uh, your organization has working groups already, or you're just getting started, or maybe you need some fresh ideas, how to walk that that talk. So um, we've done a few a few things. Um, I think the two that were most successful are the uh, ERG groups. So employee resource groups where people gather and discuss uh, usually a think piece or a topic that's important to, to them together. And uh, incidentally, the first one we've done and that really uh, drove it forward was the one about burnout. Having this shared space for people to discuss topics that are important to them is super important. This, in our opinion, is also a great way beyond the key learning to build connection between employees who do not necessarily get to work together, but may be in situations where, again, there's they have to talk about performance, they have to talk about conflict. If you have brought that empathy and that vulnerability that Alison was talking about earlier, and that compassion, if you're bringing into the mix through these working groups, and you make sure that people are aware of the difficulties everyone may be facing, it's already an easier conversation to have. And we really encourage the majority of our employees to attend these. We're also starting some that are about our culture. Uh, we have a specific culture built around some pillars and some may be harder to understand from people who come from a different organization. So what we're organizing from, from this summer onwards is an early meeting for people, again, in breakout rooms, some things that enable a, a shared confidential space to talk about what is an interesting part, what is striking, what is maybe frightening about this culture and how they can address it together to be fulfilled human beings and also happy employees. Uh, collaborative learning courses, I've just discussed. Everything you could do synchronously, see it as a version where people can follow in their own time. This is especially practical if, like us, your organization has employees in Europe, in the West Coast. Uh, I think it's nice that people can play a course and, and have this information, even if they don't have a shared space to discuss, to play a learning course that has been created by a peer will create that empathy, especially if it's a topic both parties are really interested in and is a topic that's very sensitive to them. And again, create that space for people to, uh, based on that conversation that was a learning course they followed, to create more connections within the organization. Finally, uh, coming to my favorite topic, transparency. So a huge role is actually played by the notion of transparency in DNI and the fact of publicly acknowledging in any respect, what, what are the things we need to be working on? What are the things that we're currently good at and how we can improve uh, the, a feeling of equity and inclusion in the organization? We had an initiative recently to make our diversity breakdown public. Uh, this is US data only. Uh, we're also doing the same for, for women that we can we can also do in France. And it's something we've, we're actively tracking, reporting, and being accountable in front of the organization, creating changes as well in anything we may do from recruitment strategies to any event we may organize to be as inclusive as possible. So I think this transparency should be at the key, um, the key building block of your DNI program is just not only sharing about what you want to achieve, but where you're starting from, where you want to go, what are the problems that have been identified within the organization? I haven't mentioned it, but our DNI programs are not led by HR. They're led by volunteer groups of employees who are interested and driven by these topics. And I was, as I was saying earlier, participation in such a group is a way to build more connection in the organization to maybe build a different career path if you're interested in one of these topics and finally to learn grow and stay motivated which is ultimately uh, why I, I joined the group in the first place not only to level the playing field for women but also to make sure that I could connect with the other employees on a much more personal level that would enable more compassion so Convexity, uh, you may be wondering, what is this uh, word? Maybe you've not seen it. Um, we've uh, created a culture around a few pillars, like the one I've just mentioned, transparency. 
And it's really what distinguishes us as an employee brand. And personally, the reason why I'm still working at 360 Learning is mostly because the culture is so unique that I haven't found anywhere, somewhere where transparency was so valued. It's a big draw for candidates. Um, I'll, I'll go in details about how transparency applies beyond our DNI metrics to our, our salary transparency. But uh, to give you an insight about a few others, Your Life, Your Way is the one that enables us to work from anywhere we want at any time we like, based on uh, the trust that people can do their best work whenever whenever they, they, they do it. And so we have a strong performance development system, but we also trust our employees to do that work whenever they want. The personal growth pillar is about this thing I've mentioned earlier in collaborative learning, this thing that means that you're not going to measure at the end of the month, maybe how many hours you've spent in training because that training is embedded in the way you work and approach projects. Um, these different pillars, we have, we have 13 of them, they're um, actually embodied by people in the organization. So what we have is just like we have employees group for ERGs, and, uh, and DNI, we have groups of employees for each guild. And basically, these different guilds like transparency, your life, your way, personal growth will be our sounding board whenever we update some things that will be linked to that guild. So, whenever our compensation and benefits manager will update our salary ranges and the communication we make about it when we share them transparently, uh, she will be uh, in touch with the transparency guild to hear more about it regarding the Your Life, Your Way trap, whenever we will update our remote policy or maybe uh, change the funding we give our employees to equip and have a, a wonderful setup at home, uh, they will be the one who are consulted. So we think that it's important to also give ownership of HR and career growth processes to the organization. And that's the way we've done it, as well enabling people to gather in groups and, and move forward in that, in that respect. So I think I have a, a quick poll for you. Uh, so you will have guessed that we've implemented salary transparency, but I'm curious to see if you have as well, or if you're considering it doing it, because I know it's uh, it's quite the trend right now, but it's also, it's also something that can be hard to put in place in some organizations. So I'll let you know how we've done it and what have been our kind of lesson learned around the way and recipe for success. Uh, but it'd be good to see who I'm talking to. So I see there is uh, a lot of people thinking about it or having it already in place. So that's nice. Perfect. Some will be doing it soon and some are not interested. Well, maybe in 10 slides, you'll be interested. And uh, otherwise, um, you, you, you can uh, use it as a kind of one of these HR practices that you're sure you don't want to implement. So um moving to how we do it because again it's nice talking about it uh but in the end it has to be very precise to drive fairness and again make sure that people are engaged and, and know what's out there so uh why it matters for us attracting top talent that's for sure uh we want transparency not only when we're in the organization we want it before joining it uh we're, we're saving as well some time and effort from the kind of the rumor mill and, and finally, uh, we remove that bias around people being the best negotiators, having the best salaries. I'm a very poor negotiator, so it's a very good culture for me. Maybe you're a good negotiator and you won't share my opinion. But I think this has a directly beneficial impact on your offer acceptance rate and other key talent metrics overall, as well as retention. So whenever we make an offer, the candidates really know what they can expect, but also what they can expect later on. And I think it's important for us not only to give that visibility on the career path and what you will be able to do in the future, but as well how will uh, how it will impact your 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 lifestyle. We think that beyond the salaries, as the, the employees themselves, the managers, and we call them coaches internally, they benefit a lot from salary transparency, because when you commit to that salary transparency, you free your leaders from having inconsistent one-on-one -on -one negotiations with employees as part of the performance reviews. So you give them more time for the most important stuff and to drive real conversations. Being transparent and for salaries, it gives you the ability to communicate your company targets in detail, to show your teams exactly how you're driving growth using salary incentives, for example. So you cannot really, in my opinion, 
uh, expect transparency and accountability from your teams without leaving it yourself as an HR team. And it's why it's been such a great way for us to prove our value as a company is we're not only saying transparency is one of our value, but we try to exemplify in most of the processes that uh, the employee go through during their life cycle with us. So how does it work? Uh, so we assess candidates based on the requirements of each role when they go through the hiring process and we use our current teams as comparators. So during the, the interview process, the teams that interview the candidate, they assign a level to them, which uh, will uh, be coming into focus as the candidates progress through the hiring stages. So when we make an offer, the candidates know what their default level is and it's non-negotiable. If a candidate joins us, then everyone knows what their level is. And we use eight different levels with intermediate steps with the same scale for coaches and non-coaches too, because we don't believe levels should favor people who want to be coached versus individual contributors. And that's very important. Then based on these calculations and our existing salary range set for each set of role, we, uh, for each of our markets, of course, because we're um, the salaries won't be the same in the US and France, we set the salaries expectations and we, we communicate them to candidates. So maybe to give you something a bit more precise to play with, here are our levels and what they mean, including the expected impact associated with each level. And that's again assessed every six months. So you have an opportunity based on your actual work and performance to go beyond the level you've been assigned when you first arrived. So these levels may not mean something to you right now. Maybe showing a level breakdown will be a bit uh, easier to, to understand. So um, we, we try and, and make sure that we're also measuring um, DNI figures as part of this level breakdown. And every time we do what we call a level up for people to move from one level to another, try to measure how many women ask for it, how many get it, and how, what's our ratio in the higher levels of women in the organization. So now the detail you've all been waiting for, here's what it would like uh, look like as an employee as a, the current salary range for a US sales. So what we do with the ranges is not only we make them available, but we want to design them to be targeting the 70th percentile of the tech market. We want to be in the top 30% when it comes to cash compensation. So we build that um these ranges based on the data we purchase from specialized vendors and we review them every year so that we fully capture the market and the company's growth so we have a sal um, one set of salary ranges for each market we are in but also for each eight groups of functions and all of them are available to everyone from day one so that they have all the um elements in mind as well when they're considering a career change or uh, moving in the organization that they can know what to expect. Each uh, salary range will just determine how much we offer. So I, I won't go into the details that we have time for a question, but basically we assess the role, we assess the level, then we assess the performance and we would make an offer or make it shift over time. So receiving an offer from C60 Learning ultimately means it's the last time you have to negotiate your salary. People find it shocking, especially my friends, when I tell them I haven't negotiated my salary in four years, but that's the truth. And actually, I feel much better for it, having to focus on the real conversations about my well-being, my career growth, and not just about money, which is something that's transparent, available for everyone, and not, again, a topic for rumors or, uh, or, or dissatisfaction on the part of the employees. So salary um, are, are, are based on this matrix, and I think maybe you'll, you'll have more time to cover it if you review that webinar, because it's a lot of reading and, uh, and I wouldn't want you to be bored, but I think there's something quite important uh, as far as the salary transparency is concerned, and maybe that will be my last word of advice to you, is when we share this kind of spreadsheets or dashboards or anything that's going to be available for all employees, I think the most important part beyond the numbers and the research we've done is the communication. So I'll, I'll share with you what was our last uh, internal communication about salary reviews, showing everything, right? Uh, we also sent a formal letter to formalize that outcome of the compensation review for each employee, avoid any misunderstanding, miscalculation. And we provide a calculator for everyone to project their salary movement in advance based on their project performance and the rating they already have from 
past performance reviews. So um, what we mean here is that we have a system in place, but we're also here to resolve any issue and keep that human component as part of it. But as part of the 150 people who were in scope of their reviews that year, fewer than 10 actually came back with questions and zero exception to the model was implemented. So for us, it's important to keep that in mind that fairness is not only about what you build in the system, but also how you enforce that down the line and how you make sure that your key focus ultimately is just for people to feel that trust from the organization and that you want to support the employees and make them make them thrive in your organization. All right. Oh, <laughs> Audrey, um, Allison, thank you so much for, for these um, ideas, this presentation. I think this is really insightful material. And I think um, judging from the questions, um, our audience has gotten a lot out of it. Um, right now, we just like to take um, this opportunity to invite anyone who is in the learning and development community um, to join our L&D Collective. Um, so that's a learning community um, for L&D practitioners to network, to get to know each other, get invited to events, um, good stuff like this. So if you'd like to join, um, there's a link there that you can um, use and you should have seen a little pop-up as well um, that will uh, allow you to, to join as well. So yeah, just more information there uh, on the collective. And um, before we get into the Q&A, uh, if anyone would like to learn anything more about 360 Learning, about Bravely, um, have somebody reach out, give you some more information, um, you can let us know that right now in the poll section um, at the bottom right of your screen. So um, we are going to get to Q&A. Um, I know we've got a couple of questions already. Um, there was somebody who asked earlier in the presentation, I believe it was in the context of anti-bias training, um, when you were speaking about that, Audrey, um, what kind of what kind of training you were, you were using or how, how you delivered that training, I think was the question. Uh, we created uh, a training on our platform, so uh, mostly based on research articles we'd read and a few people who shared their personal experiences as well. And so we created a course out of that, which we uh, assigned um, to all people who were performing interviews that, that quarter. And so we delivered some kind of certificate after that and hiring managers and interviewers were strongly incentivized to, to follow it. It was a short training and the goal was really to be driving questions. So to ask people if they had kind of encountered that situation and how they would react, just knowing what they've read. And we thought that this kind of short burst of, of knowledge with a lot of self-reflection was really useful. Great. Um, excellent. Okay. And I see we've got a few questions here that um, are highly upvoted. Um, one around salary transparency. Um, not surprising. So there's a question. Um, does salary transparency mean every employee's specific salary is made public to the rest of the team or uh, are salary ranges available for each role? So we have uh, three documents available. So it's not a document with everyone's salary. It's one document with everyone's level one document with everyone's performance rating for the past four quarters and one is um uh, the salary grid so basically if you want to do some math it's a very easy equation we just don't want to have everything in one single document because it, again it doesn't bring value what brings value to us is what it means to do some level uh, how do the others perform and then again what you can expect in terms of of salary for each level great um, this question, I think, probably is for, for both of you guys. Um, I love the idea of ERGs, but how do you convince people to join? I've struggled with participation. I think for, for us, and then I'll let Alison speak if she, she wants to speak to it, but uh, what was a driving factor was the willingness of people to connect, especially in the context of the pandemic in the first place and having a space where they could exchange ideas and work on different site projects. So there, were, there was a clear messaging that people wouldn't be able be have to deliver just like they would on maybe their OKRs or on their kind of targets and it would be something on the side. So kind of no pressure on that end and only added value. So for people, I think the willingness to connect with others and work on great projects was, was great. I think giving some funding to these ERGs and, and DNI groups is also uh, interesting. 
uh, to kind of build projects that people will be proud of. I have in mind a special uh, project we did uh, to make people kind of uh, more aware of the, dis um, the disabilities that you wouldn't see in the workplace. And we could work with like a motion designer and uh, write some dialogues and create some some videos that were really nice. So for people who are not in marketing or not working in video, usually it was a nice project also. So I think having this kind of project that will both bring value to the organization and help the employees develop a different skill set is a is a key driving factor that then makes sure people will will join the ERG sessions eventually. I think this is a really good question. Um, I actually have asked a lot of employees in coaching that, hey, you just mentioned this is something you're interested in. Have you looked internally? Is there employee re resource group you might be able to join? And sometimes people tell me, oh, I don't know. Um, well, I haven't. And then the question will be, usually after this, why haven't you, right? So kind of the message is, um, I tell employees, especially ICs, to, to own their own experience, their development. So that means they, sh I, I think, I think they can go out and research and explore and find, right? They can take more initiative versus a resource in front of them and probably uh, put by their manager and they're like, okay, the only thing I do is to show up. So there's a big difference between the attitude. So usually I encourage ICs to embrace this idea that they own it. So go out, search, do your research, explore, give a try or get the most out of what's available. And to managers, I get these questions from my managers. Manager says, wow, how do I engage? How do I set my team? How do I do that? So then behind that will be, uh, can we, so managers, can we help our employees to you know, have a vision, to really find a personal connection, to find a little bit high level purpose? So now they feel like they have, they have a say, they have a control, they have some decision making and that they want to do it versus you as the manager tell the employees hey why don't you do right so that's my that's my answer from my coaching um experience great no those are good those are good tips for sure um we have another question i think we have time for um i think that either of you um can can um address um promoting from within is an excellent way to motivate but how do you combat the quiet quit with employees at the higher levels that won't actually leave or reinvest? Do you know who wants to, to field that one first? I'm not sure if I'm going to be off off topic with this one, but as quiet quit, you you would mean people just uh, going going away without necessarily saying why they would do so and uh, and just not not willing maybe to move internally. That's I, I think if I'm understanding the question right, I think it's yeah, it's sort of um checking out maybe somebody who's who's checked out but um doesn't yeah. feel the impetus to to yeah, reinvest, I guess, if I'm understanding the question. From just a purely kind of tool perspective, we've implemented since the last quarterly review it's just a, a question that's hidden to the employee but visible to the executive um people in the team or the the VPs of each kind of sub function. Uh, to ask if the employee, according to them, is likely to, to quit in the um, in the coming in the coming months, and because you measure a lot of things about engagement of teams, it's uh, I think or HRBPs have that visibility as well on whether or not they should focus their effort on one team or the other. So for us, it's a good way to whenever we deliver some new training to make sure we drive it as well to the to the right team. So of course, it's not rocket science and uh we, we're, we're not sure that it can it, it can target specifically the right people but uh, on team basis level um assessing the pulse with kind of engagement surveys plus having that question is also a good way for us to to target where to to focus our effort when we're looking at performance reviews um i don't know if allison you also have an answer more from like a, a coach perspective um i um 
this is this is a good coaching conversation. I I would say right, good conversation for so for example, if the employee comes to me and share that situation, like hey, I'm just gonna quietly do this, and we will be talking about the why. Um, and it will be a completely different conversation if the managers come to me and tell me that hey, you know, this is what I sense. <laughs> what should I do? Um. So as a coach, kind of my position is that whoever I work with, um, I work for them, right? Consider I work for them. Um, so generally, I tell employees that hey, there's a reason. If you're considering doing this or that, there's a reason, and there there are also reasons why you're not sharing. So let's talk about that. And with the managers, it's the same thing, right? You you think your people, your team is having this or that way, and you're a little bit concerned. Um, let's work on that. So I think ultimately, what what a coach can do, what I can do, sometimes I tell everybody that、uh, ultimately I trust the employees, I trust the managers make the right decision that's right for them and also right for the team, right for the company.、Um, so doesn't mean that. For work, we're losing someone. Doesn't mean that for an individual, unfortunately, does not see him or her themselves fitting here and looking elsewhere. I believe it, that's a short term. I think long term wise, if the decision is right, it probably hurts us、um, a little bit in the short term. But hopefully, in the long run, this is right, especially right. For the work, so I think I'm kind of answering this question on a very high level, almost a little bit of philosophical. I would love to、uh, later on we can connect one on one. If I know a little bit more of the situation, I think I I would be able to share a little bit more. This is me very high level, a little bit of philosophical,、uh, but that this is definitely the direction I'm heading towards. The right decision for individual, and I I think if it's right for the individual, it it's right for the business as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense.、Um, great. Well, everyone, I think we're really out of time now, so we're going to to leave it here.、Um, if there were questions that we didn't get to, we'd be happy to follow up、um, via email. So, yeah, I just want to thank、uh, again our speakers, Audrey, Allison,、uh, so much for this really insightful presentation.、Um, to our audience, thank you so much for your questions and your participation.、Um, we've got some more information on the screen there if you want to learn even more.、Um, we hope to see you again soon, and I believe you guys will all get、um, redirected to a quick um, survey um, after you leave. Um, the webinar just to let us know what you thought of the event, so don't hesitate to fill it out. And again,、um, hope to see everyone、uh, again soon. Bye.